manipulation or the manipulators. So when you talk about the, manipulate, the manipulation or the manipulators, then the manipulation or the manipulators usually consist of a series of uh, rigid members, and these ones are always connected links, and they, they are always connected by joints. And then a motion of a particular joint usually cause subsequent links uh, to be attached to it, to, move, to the, 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 the links that are attached to it in order to move. And the motion of the joint is accomplished by the actuator mechanism. The actuator can be connected directly uh, to the next link through some uh, mechanical transmission uh, in order to produce torque, uh, in order to produce either torque, speed advantage, or Again, when you talk about uh, the manipulators, the manipulator usually end with a link uh, on which a tool can be mounted. And the interface between the last link and the tool or the end effector is usually referred to as the tool mounting plate or the tool flange. So when you talk about the manipulators, uh, then the manipulators usually have uh, the last link, and the last link is what usually refer to as uh, the the value. The, the, we can talk about it as the end effectors. Huh? So the end effectors is what is always used in order to manipulate envi the, the 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 environment. That is to carry, to destroy, move, or do any kind of uh, uh, modification to what is there in the environment. And when you talk about the manipulators. The manipulators generally usually consist of three divisions. So three divisions, uh, the manipulators consist of three divisions, so we can talk about the three the, the manipulator divisions. We can talk about the manipulator divisions. We say that they consist of three divisions. The first division is what we shall usually refer to as the major linkage. The major linkage and the major linkage is what we refer to as the arm that is what we refer to as the arm we also so have the second one which is the minor linkages we can talk of linkages minor linkages and this is what we shall refer to as the wrist components wrist components wrist components then we can also have uh, what we call the end effector which is the gripper or tool or hand talk of end effector end effector this can be the gripper or gripper you can talk of it as the gripper tool or hand so we can talk of it as the gripper tool or hand Paper, tool or hand. So those are the major three divisions of uh, what uh, the manipulators have. And the robots, uh, which may work in real world uh, in some way, must be in a position uh, to manipulate the environment. And that is either to pick up, modify, destroy, or otherwise an effector. And this one is always by use of hands. And this is what we refer to as the end effector. E, and these end effectors usually allow them in order to perform small range of tasks. Whereas, uh, you will find that uh, in some robots, they have fixed manipulators, which cannot be replaced. Some usually have uh, one general purpose manipulators. Uh, some of them even resemble humanoid hand. So let's talk about uh, uh, the grippers as uh, uh, part of the manipulators. We can talk about the grippers. can talk about the grippers as part of the manipulators. So we can talk about the grippers. Just as the name suggests, the grippers are generally used to grasp or hold an object and place it at a desired location. There are several grippers that we can have talk about. The grippers can be classified into several. So the first one can be the first gripper that we can have. We have what we call the mechanical grippers. Mechanical grippers. The mechanical grippers. So when you talk about the mechanical grippers, these ones are just 
frictional physical configuration of gripper, uh, uh, of the gripper that retains an object. The other one that we can talk about is the vacuum or suction cups. Vacuum, vacuum or suction cups, or suction cups. The vacuum or suction cups. So when you talk about the vacuum or suction cups, uh, these one usually are used when you are handling flat objects. You usually use them when you handle flat objects. The third one, you can talk of the magnetic or magnetized grippers. Magnetic or magnetized grippers. Magnetic or magnetized grippers. So when you talk about the magnetic or magnetized grippers, then in this case, we are simply talking of the devices that are used for handling ferrous objects. So the used in handling ferrous objects, the objects that have got uh, ion or uh, components of ion. You can also talk about electrostatic or adhesive grippers. Electrostatic stroke adhesive grippers. Electrostatic or uh, adhesive grippers. Uh, we can also talk about uh, the hooking or lifting grippers or what we simply refer to as hooks. Uh, the hooking or lifting grippers, or what we usually hooking. So we can talk of hooking or lifting grippers, or they are simply referred to as hooks. Hooking or lifting grippers that are simply referred to as hooks. And these ones are always used in order to lift parts of conveyors. The other one we can talk of the grippers for scooping or ladling powders or molten metals, plastic, or scoops. So we can talk of uh, grippers, uh, grippers uh, for scooping or landing powders, scooping powders, for scooping or landing powders, or at times they refer, refer to as molten metals, or plastics, or even scoops, and they are used uh, for fluids, powders, as well as pellets, among others. So those ones are uh, what we usually refer to as the uh, grippers that are always in use. We can look at uh, the basic motions of manipulators. The basic motions of manipulators. We can look at the basic motion of manipulators. Basic motions of manipulators. So we are going to make log ref with the reference to the six degrees of freedom. And uh, we are going to look at them uh, with, uh, with the reference to six degrees of freedom. Huh? So uh, the, the six basic uh, motions or the degrees of freedom, uh, we can talk them, about them as follows. We are going to talk about the six of them. The first one, we are going to talk about the vertical motion. The vertical motion. So after uh, we have talked about uh, what we call uh, the manipulator. Now we know that uh, the, ma the, the manipulator is uh, a representation of human arm. So when you talk about uh, the vertical motion, then when it, the, the vertical motion usually entail uh, the entire manipulator moving up and down vertically. And this one can be either uh, uh, by the means of uh, the shoulder swivel and that one can be turning it about a horizontal axis or sliding it in a vertical side. It also has the capability in order to move the wrist up and down in order to provide the desired uh, uh, vertical, uh, at, uh, the vertical attitude. In this case, we are simply talking about the arm movement. And the arm movement in this case, we are with the major reference to up and down movement of the arm. And that is what uh, we refer to as the vertical motion. The second one that we can make, we can talk about is the radial motion. The second degree of freedom, uh, the basic motions of the manipulator, or we can talk of them as the six degrees of freedom. The first one is the vertical, so this one involves the movement, majorly it involves the movement of the arm up and down. We talk about the radial uh, motion. Second one is the radial motion. 
So when you talk about the radial motion uh, or the radial movement, this is an in and out movement of the manipulator arm. Um, and it is always provided in order to allow uh, for the elbow extension by extending it and drawing it back. It usually involves the extension or the retraction uh, of the arm from the vertical center uh, uh, from the vertical center of the robot. So in that case, again, that is an arm movement. So the radial uh, basically involves uh, the movement of the manipulator arm. And this one is majorly uh, by extending and or retracting the elbow. The third one is what we shall refer to as the rotational, uh, uh, the rotational motion. Rotational, rotational motion. So when you talk about the rotational motion in this case, the rotational motion, then this one surely refers to the clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation about the vertical axis to the manipulator arm through what we refer to as the arm sweep. So we are simply talking about either clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation about the, vertical, uh, about the vertical axis to the manipulator arm. And this one is always provided by it, what we refer to as the arm switch. So you'll re realize that the first three degrees of freedom usually involve the arm movement. So we talk about the movement of the arm. And that one, we can have it illustrated by this. So you can have, look at the diagram here. And that one uh, usually have uh, the three first, the, the, the first three uh, basic motions. And we've said that these ones usually have uh, involve the rotation of the arm. So when you talk about them, you can see from the diagram, there is the rotational, uh, or there is the rotational, there is the, re the, the, the radio, and also there is uh, the vertical. And also that the, in the diagram, it is showing the directions. We can still go, we, 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 we can continue with the, the other motions and the, the, the other one, the other three now usually involve uh, the wrist, the wrist component. So the fourth degree of freedom is what we shall refer to as uh, the pitch motion. So the pitch motion, uh, when you talk of the pitch motion, this one usually enable up and down movement of the wrist and also involve the rotational movement as well. At times, it is always referred to as wrist bend. So this is what we refer to as the pitch motion. Pitch motion. And as we have said, it usually involves up and down movement of the wrist. And also, you can talk about uh, the rotational movement as well. The other one we can talk about, number five, is what we refer to as the roll motion. Roll motion. So when you talk about the roll motion, this is also known as the wrist swivel, and it enables the rotation of the wrist. So that is simply rotation of the, of the wrist. And then the last one, we can talk about the yaw, which is also called the wrist yaw. And it usually facilitates the rightward or leftward swiveling movement of the wrist. And the three of them are always uh, the movement of the wrist, so wrist movement, and they can also be illustrated by the diagram that you will you see. So you can see that in that we have the wrist yo, uh, we have the wrist roll there, then we have the robot arm, you can, we have the wrist component movement. Uh, so that one is uh, you will able to see uh, from that particular diagram how or the movements of the last six degrees of freedom can be uh, enabled. So. The next, we're going to talk about locomotion. And locomotion is simply movement. So there is a very, very, there is a need for uh, the a robot to move. So the fifth a component, the, the fifth element of the robot is locomotion. Locomotion. So when you talk about locomotion, then uh, there are several ways by which the robots can move. And we are going to look at these particular ways 
and then giving just a brief, uh, uh, maybe uh, a, a brief illustration of each and every type of movement. So under locomotion, we usually have the first one, we can talk of the rolling robots. Rolling robots. So when you talk about rolling robots, this is always uh, for simplicity. Uh, for simplicity, you will always find that most of the most mobile robots usually have four wheels or a number of continuous tracks uh, in order to enable them move. This one usually has uh, an advantage of uh, uh, efficiency as well as reduced parts and as well allowing a robot to navigate in confined places. Uh, so there are several uh, types of uh, rolling robots just to mention. Uh, we can talk of the two wheel, two wheeled balancing robots. Uh, uh, we can talk about one wheel balancing robots. We can talk about the robots that have got what we refer to as the spherical orbs. And also we can talk of the six wheeled as well as uh, the tracked robots. So those ones are examples of rolling robots. The other way by which the robots can move is walking. Walking robots. So we can talk about the walking robots. And as you may know, you, you may notice walking is always a very difficult, uh, dynamic uh, problem to solve. Because, and it is in that case that you'll find that several robots that have been made to walk uh, reliably on two legs, how they, they usually do not, they have not been made to look robust as human being. And maybe you can find that m many other robots that have been built to walk on more than two legs due to uh, the, them being easier to construct. Some of them you'll find that when they are at low speed, they walk on two legs and when they move at high speed, they walk on four legs. Maybe they behave like monkeys. So in that case, you'll find that it is very easy. Uh, for them to sprint, they use four legs. When they walk, they use two legs. And that one brings about, it is, walking is always a very, very difficult uh, thing to achieve. So that one uh, is uh, as far as the walking robots are concerned. So there are several techniques that are always used in walking uh, in, in to ensure that uh, we come up with a walking robot. One of them is what we call the ZMP technique, which is what we call uh, the zero moment point that takes into account uh, some of the algorithmic, uh, algorithm that are always used by robots. Uh, an example that uses this is the Honda, Honda that was developed, uh, the, the, the ASIMO that was developed by Honda. Uh, this particular robot uh, usually try to keep uh, uh, the, total in 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 the total balance of inertial forces. So in that case, you'll find that it uses what we refer to as ZMP technique. We also have hopping robots. Uh, that is where they jump, uh, uh, hopping around and try to ensure balance whilst they hope and move. We also have uh, the dynamic balancing or controlled falling robots. Uh, and in this case, uh, they uh, one of the robots that uses this is one is what we usually refer to as the Dexter. We also have passive dynamics. The passive dynamics uh, that is whereby uh, we try to look at how uh, a robot or, or how people, or just by use of the swinging limbs, whenever you are at a slope, you usually need no power, and so you can use the humanoid mechanisms. Uh, that can walk gently a slope or on a gentle slope, then as we move, uh, maybe on a flat you flat surface, we can add more energy. As it goes uh, on the hill, we can as well add more energy. So in that case, uh, for more information about this particular uh, techniques, you can look at triple E S dot education for some of the materials as far as the locomotion is concerned. So other methods of locomotion that uh, we can talk about, usually talk, we can talk about flying, we can talk about flying robot, we can talk about snaking robot, that is can be used in uh, places, uh, very in, to, that can be used to navigate in confined, confined places. Uh, you can also talk about skating, you can also talk about climbing robots as well. So 
Also, you can also talk about swimming robots. So those are just some ways by which the, log ro the robots are able to move. So another component the, that we can talk about is number six. We can talk about the sensors or sensory devices. Sensors or sensory devices. So when you talk about the sensors or sensory devices, uh, the robotic system should be able to sense, should be able to evaluate, make decision, and also interact with their environment. And this one can be only carried out with the perfection of sensors. When we have the sensors, then the robot is able to achieve these potentials of evaluation, making decisions, interacting, and also be able to sense uh, what is in, in, in it, in what, what exists in its environment. A robot usually receives information from the environment, and this the information is always received uh, uh, and in the environment, and it is necessary to, uh, for it to manipulate uh, or to carry out manipulation. Uh, with this, it usually sends the signal to the various joints for necessary movement and interact with the peripheral, we interact with the peripheral environment or peripheral equipment. For example, when a robot picks an object and places it uh, uh, as it understands the object is present. So there has to be sensors to enable the robot to understand the existence of an object. So it, and also it should be able to place it in a definite location. It has to, first of all, initially get the information about the presence of the object. As soon as it understands the object's presence, the arm should approach uh, the object with the control, uh, with the control speed and acceleration. And again, when it is approaching, it must be able to avoid collision with other objects. And in that case, it may also attempt to find shape as well as the orientation of the object that it is supposed to grasp or the object to be grasped. And when the, ob object, when the robot grips this particular object, it must identify the points to grip and it must be with a specified force. This one is on in order to avoid uh, the, 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 the object being uh, pressed hard or destroyed or even making it to slip. And therefore it must have the prior knowledge about the shape of the object before it is gripped and it is required and this is what is required. So all this, all this that uh, we're talking about are supposed to be achieved by use of the sensors. And the sensor must also be able to measure all the important ge geometrical parameters of the object lying in the environment. Usually, usually, uh, usually there are two basic types of sensors. And the basic type of sensors that uh, we can talk about, so maybe when we talk about the sensors, we can talk about sensors, the basic type of sensors. So we are at number six. So we are talking about the sensors. So the basic type of sensors that, that we can talk about, one of them is what we refer to as the tactile. Tactile sensors, uh, the tactile can also be referred to as contact. Contact. The second one is what we refer to as non-tactile. Non-tactile sensors, non-tactile, or we can refer to them as contactless. So let's look at uh, each type of sensor. We are going to start by looking at the tactile sensors. When you talk about the tactile sensors, then these are sensors which must be brought into contact with the object in order to obtain the signals to measure the necessary quantities. So it must touch the object itself. So without touching the object, it will not be in a position to measure uh, the physical quantity. So in that case, when tactile sensors make physical contact with the object, then there will be an electrical analog or digital signal that will be generated. And this one will be sent to the robot controller. The electrical signals may be obtained through the contact of uh, micro switch. The signals may also be obtained through mechanical pressures, which change the resistances of electric strain gauges or uh, general electric potentials. So in that case, when you talk of the contact, uh, the, the tactile sensors or the contact sensors, then they must 
come into contact. And after coming into contact, that is when there is a, a way by which the, 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 the measurement of the necessary quantity will be achieved. So some of the tactile sensors that, that we can talk about, typical types of tactile sensors can be four sensors, you can talk of the torque of the torque sensors. Uh, you can also talk about the touch sensors uh, as well as the position sensors. Some of the examples that exist uh, for, for these types of sensors, we have the micro switches, we have the piezoelectric signals, we have the potentiometers, we have uh, the electric strain gauges, we have LVDT, that is the linear voltage differential transformers. We can also talk about the resolvers as well as the encoders. So those are some of the examples as far as the tactile sensors are concerned. The second type of sensors that, that are always in use, we can talk of the non-tactile uh, non -tactile sensors or the contactless sensors. So these are sensors which sense the signals remotely by only when, when, whenever they are within a special, uh, within a specified range of distance from the object. Uh, so they usually detect uh, they detect the quantities like magnetic fields, uh, the infrared, the UV light, X-rays, electromagnetic fields, ultrasound waves, or electromagnetic waves. So those are some of the uh, quantities that uh, they usually look at in order to sense. So they must not come into contact with the object they are supposed to sense for. But basically, after being put at, a diff at, at some range of distance from the object, they are able to see or, or they are able to detect uh, the measure the, the, and, and measure uh, the various quantities. So the typical uh, sensors that uh, use this particular technique, we can talk of the proximity sensors, uh, whereby whenever it is near within some distance, it is able to see to check on the physical quantity. We also have ultrasonic sensors. We can also talk about electro optical sensors, uh, range imaging sensors, magnetic sensors. Uh, as well as uh, 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 